right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So today's talk is a little bit special. It's very unique. Uh, it's part of our partnership with the Arctic Institute of North America. So they are Canada's first and longest-lived Arctic Research Institute. And over the next few months and over the past few months, we've had the pleasure of working with them on highlighting some really amazing Arctic stories. And in our work with kids across Canada, one of the big yearnings is for more stories of what's going on in the Arctic. There's, it's opening up to the public, it's opening up for tourism, it's opening up for development. And so there's a huge interest for a lot of kids worldwide and certainly across Canada in understanding some of the challenges um, and opportunities that are happening in Canada's north. So I'm really excited to dive in with today's talk and especially on this topic. So we are joined by Dr. Jennifer Provencher, and two notes about her before we get started. Her work today, her talk is gonna talk about plastic pollution in the Arctic, which again, plastic pollution is a topic that is wildly popular now. It's in the news, it's something that no one was really thinking about in a serious way in the public until the last 10 years or so. And now classrooms across Canada, around the world are really keen to understand more about these challenges. So plastic pollution in the Arctic is our theme of the day. And when I have the I've had the privilege of working with a lot of uh, amazing plastic pollution researchers personally and through our organization, and almost every single one of them says, have you talked to Jennifer? So you could not be having a better guide uh, than Dr. Provence today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so, so much for joining us, and I cannot wait for your talk. Take it away. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jesse. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to everyone, and certainly with the Institute of North America. They've been super supportive of my work through my graduate degrees, and it's really exciting to be here. So I will turn to my presentation. I'm going to turn my webcam off just because I'm having some like, challenges as we all, you know, learn from working from home and what that looks like. So today, yeah, I want to give a shout out to everyone who's tuned in today, all the students. I, I was a student. I love biology. I love science. But, you know, I never thought I, you know, could imagine where it has taken me in the last couple of years. Um, and so I am now a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I focus mostly on plastic pollution and contaminants, but we do a few other things. So just really quickly, I work on wildlife health. And so lots of people say, well, what is wildlife health? And so we think a lot about migratory birds because I do work for Environment and Climate Change Canada. And in my group in particular, we think about uh, plastic pollution. So you can see in this picture, it's an albatross chicken. It's got a whole bunch of plastic in the stomach. In my lab, we also talk about pathogens or other regions, diseases, uh, reasons why you would have kind of mass mortality or unusual mortality in birds. We also have been doing a lot more oil work. So this is where birds, um, you know, they could get oiled, um, but we're thinking more about this in terms of what it looks like from a contaminant perspective. And so these are all things up here in the way that we, we think about it and specifically what I work on. We also have other groups and, and connections where we think about bigger plastics, so litter and an entanglement. I also have projects on fisheries, and so this is kind of a plastic one as well, but birds can get entangled in fishing gear. We think about this. And of course, there's harvest. And so we have harvest in Canada, we have traditional harvest and harvest worldwide. So all of these things can affect bird, bird health. And so these are things that we work on, but it's kind of this top row that we think about the most. So today we're going to be talking specifically about plastic pollution in the Arctic. And so these are all pictures of plastic pollution that have been found in the Arctic. In this top corner are all the plastics that we have found inside of space. This is actually a picture from my, my master's that I did about 10 years ago. And then these are some of the pictures. So this is an Arctic turn with larger plastic litter. It's been entangled, care entanglement for sure. Uh, these are these are borrowed pictures um, on Svalbard where we've seen this happen. We have a project where we look at plastic on beaches. Uh, we have some work on that. And then this is a picture that I took actually in a Callaway, where it is a larger piece of plastic that um, you know has been entangled. And so these are all kind of things I think about on a regular basis. Now in, in plastic, in the world of plastic, size matters. And so probably lots of you are familiar with kind of what we call macro plastic or mega plastic. These are plastic bottles, and, you know, fishing nets and other things that are, are really large and we can see. 
most of my work is in this middle section. So these are mesoplastics, they're microplastics, and, and these are plastics that you can hold in the palm of your hand, animals eat, uh, and there's a couple of different definitions for them depending on, on what you're talking about, but this is kind of the roughly the size. So these, these squares are half a centimeter by half a centimeter to give you an idea. And, you know, to recognize that they also go really low. So these are kind of, kind of ultra fine plastics or even down to nanoplastics. And nanoplastics in particular are plastics are so small, they can actually cross the, your cellular barriers. They, they can enter a cell. Um, and so this is something that we, we, we think about. We don't have a lot of power to detect in wildlife right now, but we do think about as we think about plastics. Now, the history of kind of ingested litter or ingested debris in seabirds actually goes back a lot farther than people think. The first report of a candlestick, so you know, a piece of man-made man -made litter instead of a bird, goes back to 1838. Uh, and it was in this type of bird, the Wilson Storm Petrel. So this is not a new occurrence for birds. You see this bird is one of the petrels and it is, they're really cool they kind of do this pit pattern along the surface of the water and they eat you know invertebrates and the plankton and, and things that are at the top so you can imagine if there's plastic in there or debris of any sort the birds are going to pick this up and so this is you know this is the the ingestion of non-food items by birds is not a a new new topic but certainly the uh, plastic pollution is is newer and these are images of, of albatross sharks, lays in albatross sharks by Chris Jordan on, in Hawaii. He's done a fabulous job of documenting this. And these are chicks who have starved on the colony, died on the colony before ever leaving their, their bird colony. Um, and of course, as the bodies decompose, these stomachs open up and, and you can see all the plastic that's been accumulated. It's, it's worth noting that these birds are, are Full. They feel full, but they're actually malnourished at the same time because of the you know, stomach is physically full, but there's no nutrients coming in. And also, you know, one of the things that I learned about when I was in high school, which you know intrigued me to no end, was uh, this this accident that turns into science, where 29,000 rubber duckies actually fell off a cargo ship between Hong Kong and Tacoma. And it was this very particular type of, of rubber ducky that, that didn't sink essentially. And they tracked these rubber duckies for, for years in the ocean. And, and Charles Ebsmeyer actually turned this into a, a program where he, he would pay people to recover these, these and turn them in as part of his, his program. And these ducks were, were found all over the Pacific. You could, you know, there's lots of written about them. But they traveled through the Arctic and actually ended up on several beaches in North America and Europe on the Atlantic side. And so I think, you know, I just think it goes to show you that these plastic pieces, these large, intact, highly recognizable plastic pieces, pieces are really persistent in the in the background. So you know, we most of us weren't thinking about plastic pollution and tracking plastic pollution when this rubber ducky incident occurred, but it certainly has told us since a lot about how plastic can move through multiple oceans of over decades. And you know, unfortunately, this still occurs today. Um, just recently, uh, in 2019, there was actually a large spill that happened. It was the MSC's Zoe, and they lost about 300 containers in a storm. It's in the North Sea, and the, the shipment containers are actually mostly IKEA furniture and My Little Pony dolls. Um, my five-year-old daughter thinks is the most hilarious. There are now beaches with these My Little Ponies. Uh, you know, the wash ashore in high and high levels. And so it can be, there are many, the many islands in this region and the debris is highly different between these islands, but it, this, uh, you know, there are these islands where this is actually a, a colleague of mine took this picture where the debris is washing out. So this is still happening in the world today. So we still have plastic inputs from multiple sources. We have, so we looked at this kind of over time and we actually did a, a study a few years ago where we went back and we studied the literature and we looked at all the fish and the turtles and mammals and seabirds to see how far back these records go. And at that time, when we, when we did this study, it was up until about 2015, the seabird literature had kind of been tracking this phenomenon the most oh, over time. And so the seabirds are this kind of group 
that is very useful to think about in terms of, you know, monitoring what can it tell about plastics and, uh, you know, the fate of plastics in the environment for the effects. Um, and I would say really interestingly is that the fish are this like kind of little tiny bar or, um, you know, line on this graph. But since this time it continues, there's a huge amount of work in fish. And so it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds over time. So just a little primer, now that we're kind of deep into talking about plastics, there's, there's industrial plastics and user plastics. And industrial plastics are these uh, pellets or, or nurdles that come out of the um, you know, hydrocarbons that are used for plastics. It's the raw plastic, not additives and colors added to them. But this is how plastic is shipped around the world. And then as they go to plastic factories, this is where all of those nurdles and pellets actually get formed into consumer plastic or user plastic. And that's all they do. It's the, it's the phones that we're talking on, the computers that you're probably sitting at, the chairs you're on, the desks, all of these things. And it's both types of plastic that enter the ocean each year. So it's about 20 billion pounds of plastic that enter the ocean each year. And unfortunately, it's that plastic that ends up in the stuffing of biotas. And so just for context, that means it's, it's been estimated that about a dump truck of plastic enters the ocean every minute. So just as I started talking, about 10 dump trucks of plastics is, you know, the equivalent of 10 dump trucks of plastic into the ocean and kind of, you know, beep, 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 and then dumped in their plastics. And so just something to consider as we move through the talk, you know, this is this is on, uh, it's, not, it's not a past event. It has been estimated uh, by a couple of different, you know, kind of international organizations that over 800 species interact with plastic pollution. So that would include entanglement, using it to build their nest. And then just over 200 species have been uh, known to ingest. I will also know that these reports are, they're not very old, uh, you know, a couple of years, three and four years old. But there's so much work being done on these on these topics that this, these numbers are being updated all the time, which is actually really why a lot of us are hesitant to kind of put numbers on these because you know you can make them for numbers and a week later they're actually changed. Now in the North Sea, uh, over in Europe, so the North Sea is the piece of water between kind of continental Europe, uh, the UK, and Scandinavia. And they've actually been a lot more concerned about plastic pollutions longer than, than most other jurisdictions. And so in the 1970s, there was a, a few different international conventions. And then specifically in 1992, it, there was called the Oslo Paris Convention for the Protection of the Marine Environment. And this was actually one of the first times where they define plastic pollution in an indicator species. And specifically, this are this this piece of legislation, this, this agreement actually names a specific seabird. It's called the northern fulmar. Northern fulmars are, are relatives of albatross, so a, a lot smaller. Uh, and really importantly, the the convention actually is very specific around its language. And and I don't like to put a lot of words on the slides, but I think it's really important to you know, recognize that this is from the legislation or from the agreement. And it says, you know, there should be less than 10% of fulmars that have 0.1 grams or more in their stomach in a sample of 50 to 100 feet children in five different regions over a period of five years. And what I love about this is that it's actually very specific. It's, it's got the number of sample sizes, it's got the number of regions, it's got a time period, it's got a value. And so it's, it's really specific, which is, is very helpful when we're trying to, you know, when you're a scientist, you then have to, you know, carry out these types. Program. And so this is, uh, you know, this has been in place for, for several decades now and we're continuing to build upon. And what's really cool is when you have these long-term programs, you can actually start to see changes in time. And so you can see in the 1980s, you, we actually had higher levels of industrial pellets. In, in the birds, and you can see that we actually see this decline over time. And what's really interesting is that the, uh, there were a number of programs with industry that kind of recognized these nurdles in the environment and, and worked with the industry to put into place practices that help reduce the loss of these pellets to the environment. On the flip side of that, you know, we have these our user plastics, and then we see these high levels go up, and, and you can see it kind of goes back down, and the data uh, kind of goes off. It, it's, it's really interesting to see these kind of high splits and these low. So 
it can I think this is important to show that we have, you know, we, when we do actions, we can reduce the impact on the environment, but it, it, you know, sometimes there's a time lag, but only with these monitoring programs can we actually see if what we're doing is actually leading to the change that we, we hope for. So we have northern fulmars in Canada. These are species that are present on all four of Canada's coast. Uh, so this is a you know a picture of, of uh, North America, Turtle Island, and so you see that they breed up here in the pink, which is you know the north. America and then year round, uh, it's more the, the purple and the non green is blue. So, one of the things that we were uh, did uh, actually during the, the last international poll year, and as part of my, of my work on my matters, was to actually look at more than the plastic ingestion on all three of Canada's coastlines. And so, we, we've done this with a variety of partners over time. And so we're going to do a little bit of a quiz, see if you guys are, you know, paying attention. Um, if we can, you know, in, in science, it's always good to form hypothesis, do some guessing, some decision making. And so what we're going to do is that four sites here, Lake Huron, which is on the Pacific coast of Canada, Prince Leopold Island, which is a very, it's not an island, it's so tiny, it's a very tiny little island way up here in Lancaster Hunt. The Labrador Sea, which is this area of water off of the coast of, of Nunatia, Labrador, and the same island again is a very small island off the coast of Nova Scotia, uh, way down here in Southern Canada. And we actually have uh, seabird full mar samples from all four of these of these uh, samples or all these regions. And what I have, I'm going to switch my camera here. So keep this in mind. There's these four sites. And I'm going to turn my camera on. And what we have here, hopefully you can see me. Perfect, thank you, Jesse. What we have here is we have human equivalent. So if you were a full bar tabled from one of those four regions, this is what you would have in your stomach. I'm just going to show you here. So I'm going to show you four bags. This is one. This is bag one. It's the fullest, the heaviest. And if you were a full bar, tabled at one of these four sites, this is what you would have in your stomach. So not what the full bar has in the stomach. It's very Small, but this is what you would actually have in your stomach. The so keep these, keep these up, Jennifer. Like they're not showing right okay. now. Your, your video is a little iffy, so we're not able to really see the bags right now. So keep okay. them up. Um, but I will toggle back between this. So you're you're highlighting. Oh, we got there. You go. You're in for a second. So we've got bags full of trash um, from the various sites that we showed in the first screen. So if you check out the full screen, we've got these four amazing, like these four sites around Canada: Prince Leopold, Labrador, Sable Island, and Vancouver Island. And oh, now we got all four bags up. So what we're trying to do for all of you joining in on YouTube and the Arctic Institute channel on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants with all the tech difficulties, let's keep it interesting, um, is try and match which one of the bags of trash is associated with which one of the groups. So basically, in which area did the birds have the most trash inside their stomach and which area did they have the least? Is that about right, Dr. Provence? You got it. So and we're just going to say the bag four, sorry, bag one is the fullest. This would be the human equivalent. Two and three are intermediary, and bag, the smallest bag, bag four, is the lowest. And that's all you have to remember. Bag one, biggest, bag four, smallest. And what I want you to do is think about of these four sites that you can see on the on the screen, where would you say bag one, the fullest bag, and two and three would be the intermediary, and then all the way down to bag four, which is actually just a tiny little bag with just a few pieces of plastic in it. And so I'm going to just type it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put the call out to people on YouTube. So basically, of the four things in the screen right now, the four places across Canada and sort of ending in the U.S. as well, which area would you expect birds to have the most plastic in their stomach versus the least? So I know for me personally, I know that there's a lot of people that live near Vancouver Island. So I would expect Vancouver Island would probably have the most. And I think Prince Leopold Island would probably have the least because it's so far removed from everything else. So that's my guess. And then if anyone else has any guesses tuning in on YouTube, you're welcome to share them there. I'll pass them along if you do. Um, 
And thank you to everyone on YouTube for highlighting the audio difficulties too. I do appreciate that. <laughs> um, we're gonna try and make it work. So so far, no one's shared anything. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put my plug in for Vancouver Island as number one, Prince Leopold Island for number four down the list, maybe Labrador Sea for the second least, and Sable Island for second. I think that the places that are closer to the bigger population centers will have more. And then as you go further north, we'll have less plastic in the bird stomachs. What do you think, Jennifer? Yeah, Jeff, I think you've got some some good rationale there for sure. And I'm gonna put up the answer. So I want everyone to to think about that there are lots of things that we are exploring. And I very few people have actually kind of gotten all the answers right at the very first time. And so I'm gonna put up the answers there. Hopefully you can see them. So while the Island certainly does have a lot of people, I actually find that by mass, it's, it's actually number two. It's lighter, but interestingly, it has more numerous pieces. So they have lots of little pieces off of Vancouver Island. Where Sable Island actually has the heaviest load of plastics, um, they're often bigger. And so the, the bird, isn't if you're a bird, weight weight matters because you have to fly. And so Sable Island actually has their highest level. You get a Prince Leopold correct. It is the least. So those Arctic birds have the lowest levels of plastic. And so this is this is interesting because it tells us a little bit more about the the source of plastic. And so one thing to keep in mind is that while Sable Island and Atlantic Canada is quite uh, low population, uh, they are downstream, if you think of the Gulf Stream going along this way, downstream from a whole lot of big cities, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S. And so you often, from a perspective, have to think about these kind of wider gyres that kind of are operating in these regions. So it's, it's sometimes it, it, sometimes what we find kind of makes sense, and then other times it kind of challenges us, and we have to think more about where the birds are actually getting our plastics from. So by doing this type of work, we have been able to sample at a whole bunch of different sites. We have people in the Western North Atlantic, so this is you know Eastern Canada. Eastern North Atlantic, so, so Europe, and then of course the Western North Pacific, North America. And although there's a little variation in each one of these ocean regions or coastal regions, as we go from north to south, we see an increase. And that happens across these three uh, regions. And so it means that really in the Arctic, we've got the low levels and that occurs you know, in each one of these regions. And they're much lower in the Arctic as compared to some of the other regions in further south that have been looked at. But of course, seabirds are different. Just because one seabird has plastic pollution doesn't mean they all do. Uh, and we see that these are northern flowers we've been talking about. They're, they're surface feeders. And we see high levels in those species, but this is that Florence Poon, who was a student with me. Uh, who has gone on to do a master's at the University of Toronto. She found low levels of plastic in kitty eggs and these other two species, Mars and Gilma, she found no plastic. So just because one species of seabirds has plastic doesn't mean they all do, which is really important to consider. The other thing is that they can, it can be really high levels of plastic. So this is actually worked at the Har States, again, was a student with me. She looked at gulls and all the plastic pollution in the gulls uh, from, from uh, a, gull, a dump site in Newfoundland. So these are these are birds that are often uh, collected or culled uh, because they're a danger to the air. So we get to look at them. You can see there's all kinds of not just plastic but litter. You can see aluminum foil. You can even see some packaging. And when you start talking about gulls, you actually can. Um, you know, really, really start to think about all the types of stuff that we throw away and then end up in birds. Now, often people ask me about what are the answers of bird groups, and I, and I don't want to talk about this graph too much, um, but I do like it. It's, it's colorful and it really, you know, things that we're talking about all the other things that I've been thinking about. And, and then what this is is that a colleague, Stephanie A. Frigon, 
So okay, well, we've done data on some bird species. What about the other bird species? And so she actually looked at uh, doing a, it's called a phylogenetic approach. And so it basically means that our birds that are more related actually have higher levels of plastics that compared to each other than other species. Um, and the answer is yes. And so basically it, it, it comes down to, you know, if you're, if you're related, you're often more likely to have plastics because there's certain characteristics that those groups of birds have. And so I think, you know, we don't need to dive into the details of this, but I think it's interesting to think about that there are these different ways to, to look at it and different ways to examine the relationships. Um, and one of the ways we do this is it's through standardized methods. And this is, you know, kind of um, two big pieces of work that my lab did. It basically sets out the, the map or the protocol for reporting plastics in, in birds and, and other vertebrates. And so this is a huge amount of work with a very uh, awesome group of scientists from around the world that we've worked on. Um, and so these are grapers, they're, they're highly cited. Uh, and sometimes this is not the you know most exciting work to do. You know, a protocol, um, really, really important if we actually want to uh, you know compare data, make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges across the entire globe. And so uh, the other work that we've been doing on kind of the of comparing is actually with the Arctic Council. And in some of you may know the Arctic Council structure. Uh, you know, this is if you're kind of into policy or governance or thinking about how international relations work together, uh, the Arctic Council is a really, really cool model or example. Um, and I'm part of a group that looks at microplastics and litter across the Arctic Council. And so there are these working groups of the Arctic Council where the Arctic states and observers and permanent participants kind of get together and agree to work on different topics. And the three that we work with are, are CAF, PAIN, and AMAP. And for those of you who are familiar with it, they have some really great resources and teaching um, tools online. But the main idea is that CAF works on the conservation, so whether populations are going up or down. Theme is really about protection, so making sure there are intact marine environments. And then AMF does a lot of work on contaminant and climate change. And what the groups are now looking at is more um, how do we work together on plastic pollution? Because as Jenny said, you know, 10 years ago, um, there weren't a lot of people talking about this. <laughs> there was me, you know, and, and, and a few others talking about it in, in, in kind of conferences and in papers. And it wasn't a huge deal, but but now it is. And so we actually do have to work across these groups in coordination among the Arctic Council. And this just kind of um, communicates how some of that stuff is actually working together. It's not It's not always simple, it's not always straightforward, but it's really, really important to do cooperation across international uh, colleagues and families to make sure that, you know, again, want to understand what the levels are in the Arctic, you can actually start to compare it. It's also a really cool group to work with. Uh, there are eight of us who are from Canada, and we also have members from the Kingdom of Denmark, Faroes, Germany, Sweden, and the U.S. And I just put this up to, again, really show what a, a cool national group is, and we all bring different areas of expertise to the group with the goal that we have experts on all these different things. And, and, the, and the goal often, right, is, again, although it's difficult and hard sometimes to get, you know, four people to agree, uh, it, it is worth it. It really makes for strong science that can be taken forward. Before we were able to travel bans, we were able to meet in Copenhagen. There's actually 32 experts at this table. Um, and we did discuss kind of all these different environmental compartments. And, you know, I put a picture and I often laugh that you know, this, is, this is our group. This is often where science is done. This is often where hard questions of science is answered is, is making people sit down either around a, you know, a physical table or a virtual table and talking about definitions, what the goals are. And I often love this picture because I this is actually a time I'm, I'm the co-chair of this group and I made this group sit down and the root of this picture was I, I basically challenged them to define the smallest size of plastic that they could all measure. And they had to come back to me with one number. 
Uh, and so this is, you know, science is in the field, but when we talk about international relations, this is often where a lot of those discussions and hard work is done. It's not done in the field, it's done when you have to bring lots of different ideas uh, together. We are working to form the standardized method for the Pan-Arctic region, and you can see a map on the right, and this is a map of all the places that we have you know, plastic and litter data from so far. Uh, and, and we're kind of working to collate and collect all that different information. And basically what we've been asked to do is come up with a, letter, a, a number of core recommendations. And so at the bottom, you can see all the different compartments that we discussed, that we, that we talked about. And up at the top, our, our core recommendations are tier one recommendations. We're still working on our thing. Is that everyone should go home and monitor water, marine sediments, beaches and shorelines, and seabirds. And so, by, by doing these, the hope is that when we come back in five or ten years, everyone across the Arctic will have data on these four compartments. It will all be done in the same way, and we can make some really cool maps and talk about patterns. We also have been doing work on thinking about not just where plastics end up in the environment, but also how seabirds can be a vector of it. Uh, this is really cool work that we have done with we have done with seaweed hunters in northern Canada. And typically, what we do is we look for plastics here in the stomach, right? They kind of build up in the gut. In this project, we actually looked at just before the poop would come out, you know, when we first published this paper, I was calling it the fecal sample or the guano sample and review or, you know, appropriately. So with the guano, technically it's not guano because it's not out yet. Well, that is a good point. So I often call this the pre paper, it's like the moment before the actual poop. So we find microplastics uh, in this pre poop sample. And so we've done some really cool work colleagues from uh, Kika Tarjwa, Nunavut, University of Toronto, Acadia, Carmen, where we've actually looked at this bird, uh, the bird colony. So this is a colony. It's hard to see that these are all the birds. That's why it's white. There's no grass because the birds are there. And then we took air, water, soil, and muscle samples kind of at the bottom of the colony, at the end of the colony, and then every one kilometer moving away. And the idea is, is that if the birds are pooping out all these microplastics, then there's going to be a whole lot of microplastics right under the colony where the poop is, and that's going to be the way there'll be less and less. And this is the real really work that we, we've done. So Madeline Bourdais, she's a student of mine, she quantified all these microfibers. And again, these are poop samples, pre-poop pre samples, uh, where you look at all these microfibers, and then she used the number birds on the colony and she estimated that this this bird these fulmars at this one colony poop at about three million pieces per year but really interestingly the fulmar which doesn't have as many plastics they are denser and, and frankly poop a lot more because they're kind of this brown and pink is kind of all the poop they potentially are pooping out 45 million pieces a year so this is some work we're trying to figure out you know are Potential bird poop potentially really uh, you know, contaminating the area in the, the colonies, which are often protected areas. And so, Bonnie Hamilton, who's a student uh, at the University of Toronto, she's done this work where we looked at uh, atmospheric fallout of plastics, we looked at, again, the bird poop of plastics, we looked at the sediments, and we looked at the water. And what she found is a graph here that kind of uh, tells us a little bit, but you can see a really huge difference here, right? These are fibers, full marguado, pre-poop samples are, are fibers, surface sediments, sediments are fibers, and then you've got these, these paint chips. They're very different. They look like fragments. And so what we've been doing more recently is taking our, our plastic pieces and we put them into a machine called a ramen or FDIR. And these are actually samples from, from water in Kikitarjwak um, in, in Nunavut. And we can see that all, almost 50% of these are actually paint-derived plastic samples. Um, and, and what they look like is actually this. There are these little tiny pieces of plastic paint. And so you can see this for scale. This is a piece of tape. It's like a piece of scotch tape that you all are familiar with. And so these are all these little paint fragments that we pulled out of these water samples. And so we've been, we've been talking a lot with our international partners, you know, how to, how to qualify that amount of plastic. And then, traditional sense of the word there, very much plastic derived. 
And so that's some of the work that uh, the students have been leading. It's really exciting to start to come out and, and see what, what it means for different groups. Um, we, we do have this other kind of component of our work where we talk about chemicals. So we often think about the physical effects, right? It blocks your stomach. It can cause this false satiation, this false sense of feeling full. But then there's also this chemical effect where you've got plastic additive leaching out. And so this is what I did my, my postdoc on um, when I was at a key funded by uh, a few different partners. And, you know, historically, this is again from Madeline's work, historically, we often say that fibers are fragments. So this is kind of like the old school way to quantify it. We often have, we are better at doing color. So you can see this is how we would define it as color. And then Madeline's work, as, as well as many others, have really taken it up a step and started adding polymer type. And so these are the SGIR spectra, so that each, each piece uh, or gives a spectra, then you match it to a spectral library. Um, and then that allows you to identify it to a spectra. So this is, so it's a different way of looking at it. So you can look at the physical shape, you can look at the physical color, and you can look at the polar type. And this all adds pieces of information to our puzzle. And I think really importantly, the implication for, for wildlife is that, you know, probably all of you have used plastic to eat on or, um, you know, serve your food or store your food, but it's all food grade plastic for the most part. Um, so we're not worried about that it is leaching out. But when we're talking about birds, they're, they're getting food grade, but also, uh, you know, all kinds of plastic. So there's, they're getting this cocktail of chemical contaminants. It's a lot more challenging. And we've started to look at this in, in eggs and livers. So these are two species. We know that they have low levels of plastic ingestion and high levels of plastic ingestion. And I, I thought when we started the study that we would have low levels in the kitty wake for these additives and higher levels in the fulmars. But as you can see, you know, there's not really anything different. But I think what's more important back to this really tiny little bars down here. And this is what is in the eggs. And so this actually tells us that not only is the bird taking in the plastic additives, but it's actually passing on to their eggs. And so that can be a problem in a pond itself. And so we did this in the birds. And so, this is, you know, this is from uh, work that we did with uh, Dr. Zha Lu. And they said the birds, but we also found these seals. And so seals had actually plastic additives in their liver. And so this is kind of we go, huh, okay, so seals. I didn't really look into the plastic ingestion before. So this actually led to another study we did with, uh, again, seal stomachs collected by eating meat harvesters. Uh, Madeline, again, to mind, she looked at 142 seal stomachs in Nunavut collected uh, in a couple of different places, and we found no plastics. So she looked down to about 425 microns, and she did not find a single piece of plastic. So it's a good news story, uh, kind of exciting to find a species with no ingested plastics. Uh, it also means that this species is uh, not necessarily for, for monitoring plastic. So uh, it was, again, another piece of our puzzle. And so just to kind of confer, you know, go over is that we, the problem with plastics is that it has both these, these additives as well as these environmental chemicals. And so this is what we're exploring more and more. It's this, this cocktail of additives. And then lastly, what I'll do is um, speaks to this idea that we are working a lot with Indigenous partners in, in science and Indigenous knowledge. And so what the goal of a lot of our work, and it can be done in a couple of different ways, is really to understand how these two different knowledge systems can really inform uh, each other and produce, synthesize, and process information. And because my job is as a government scientist, a lot of what I need to do is, is inform policy and inform, you know, government actions and agendas. And so uh, in all of my work, we really strive to, to make sure that we're weaving science and indigenous knowledge together to inform policy. And I think I'll just end on this idea of, of braiding Indigenous knowledge and Western science approaches. And we, are, we think a lot about this in these, these days. Um, there's all kinds of different weaves. They can be very tight weaves where the project is very coupled with a community or a nation or co-producing and co-analyzing. 
some of our plastic projects look like that. But then we also have these loose weave where the communities give research, I often refer to as homework. Um, and then we, you know, we share results and it's, it's more of like a, um, a reporting back and forwarding discussion. And this is all kind of going on in and amongst our plastic work. Uh, so just recognizing that these these ways of knowing are really important to how we're understanding plastics and plastic pollution and its effect on the ecosystem, specifically in the Arctic. And I think I'll leave it there and perhaps take a few questions if there's time. Fantastic. Well, there's tons of time, uh, Jennifer, so that was great. Feel free to keep your camera off. I know that the connection's a little iffy, and uh, uh, I thank you to all our classes that did stick around for the entire broadcast. You covered so, so much, so I really, really appreciate you sharing your time uh, and knowledge with us today. If you want to end your screen share, too, so that you can see me or however that works, you're welcome to do that. Um, and yeah, we're going to dive in with questions. If you're on YouTube, on the AINA channel, or on Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants' channel, please do share your questions. I'll take as many as I can. But I want to start off with one that we get all the time, which is, how did you get into this career? What was that? Was there something specific that happened to you? Was there a, a course you took or something as a, a child that pushed you into this really, really exciting uh, sort of diverse scientific field? Yeah, thanks, Jesse. So I actually uh, credit my going into biology to my high school biology teacher. His name is Mr. Cool. Bostachek. I grew up in, in Brampton, Ontario, and I went to Central Peel, and he was a teacher who... Um, you know, I didn't I didn't have a lot of experience outside of Brampton. It's clearly nowhere near the ocean, if you know any geography of Ontario. Um, but he was a diver. And so he would go diving on vacations and he would bring back pictures of coral reefs and all these cool marine life. And it was super cool. And I just at that point, I thought, you know, that that is something I want to see in this world. And so I went on to do a degree in marine biology and and really just kind of followed a whole bunch of opportunities. People um, you know, I was, I was given opportunities to work on different projects and do different things. And, and yeah, it wasn't ever a planned course, but certainly it was actually my high school biology teacher who set me on this path. Yeah. Fantastic. It's funny how many uh, great teachers in life can make such a big difference. And I, you mentioned diving. I want to stress as we've got a bunch of kids today. If you're ever interested in scuba diving universally, like Jennifer, uh, everyone who does it seems to really enjoy it. Uh, a lot of amazing careers come about from scuba diving. And at 10 years old, you can start on the path to becoming a scuba diver. So if you're keen, no matter where you are, no matter how far from an ocean, there's probably a dive center near you. It's one of the most enriching things you can do. And uh, hopefully when the world opens up again, there's a lot more opportunity. <laughs> I can't recommend it enough. So Arctic field work, you, you have the chance to, to go to these amazing places. What does that look like when you go to the Arctic for people that might not know, who have never gone, who think of it as some distant wilderness? What is Arctic field work actually like? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So Arctic field work can look like a lot of different things. So my first time to the Arctic, I was actually working in Alaska. And I, 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 was, I was probably about 22 years old. We flew to Juneau. I had a huge shopping list. I had to go buy at the store. And I loaded everything up on a plane. And the plane actually took us to an island on a seal colony where I had to live with one other person for two months. And we didn't see each other a lot because we did shifts. We did observation shifts. So I was technically on the island with one, one other person, yeah. except that I did a four-hour shift and then they did a four-hour shift, which basically means you spend eight hours by yourself every single day. And so, it, and, and it was winter. <laughs> so <laughs> we had short, short days. So it can look like that. And, and certainly I've been in a lot of um, Arctic field camps since then that are similar. You know, we, we often have, you know, small cabins. You, you can have outdoor kitchens. It can be a real challenge. The other thing, though, I think that, you know, I want to recognize is that increasingly, because we are doing partnerships with communities and we're trying to actively weave uh, Indigenous science and Indigenous knowledge, is we spend a lot more time, specifically now for me, I spend a lot more time in community. Yeah. And so the field work part of it is, is whenever I leave my home, and that does mean I might go and sit in community for two weeks and meet with people and chat. Sometimes it means doing surveys. Sometimes it means attending meetings and sitting in the back and listening. Right. And so one of the things that I find the most exciting about Arctic field work is that it can mean different things to different people. Um, but as long as you go in, uh, you know, with 
with ideas about how you can be respectful and collaborative. Uh, there's something for everyone. Yeah. I love this idea of interacting with communities and getting out and connecting with people. So this is something that both Arctic Institute of North America uh, talks about, heavily focuses on. Certainly our last talk that was to sort of both channels at the same time was all about uh, early Arctic research and connecting with Indigenous communities and how important that was. Uh, at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we have Secret Path Week uh, with 15 plus amazing storytellers every single year in October, uh, not to mention a session throughout the year. So this is something that, again, a lot of classes are, are getting really interested in and, and Canadians in general are getting really interested in. So it's really nice to hear that this is something that's reflected in modern day research, in plastic pollution research and, and beyond. So thank you so much for that answer. Um, we're starting to get some great questions coming in on YouTube that touch upon the same thing. So I'm gonna try and take elements of them from each class. So Miss Hartman's class, they're at Eagle Plains Public School. They wanna know how plastics have made their way into the oceans, into these waters. Like how do you end up with plastics in Prince Leopold Island, like up there in the north? How does that happen? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's one that we're struggling with. Certainly that we think that there's two or three major pathways. One, uh, so you can think about your, you know, a wrapper from your lunch, you, you put it into the garbage, you, you know, it gets carried away to a landfill or a dump, and frankly, you know, it can blow out. And so we think that, you know, even if you, if you're, if you're good and diligent, it can blow out into the environment. Uh, and, you know, like the old adage is, you know, all rivers lead to the ocean. So it does end up in the ocean. And again, going back to that rubber ducky example, it, it moves. Ocean currents can travel large distances. And because plastics are persistent, you know, they go along for the ride. So certainly water is a big one. Yeah. Um, there are other studies where, you know, not so much in the Arctic, but in other parts of the world where shipping can contribute to plastic pollution. So again, right, we don't have shipping in the Arctic per se, but in other places we know containers fall off ships. We know that sometimes it can be intentional. Most of the time it's not intentional, but it can happen. And then the third way, which is one of the things that I'm super interested in, is how animals can move it. Mm. So you can imagine that birds like fulmars actually spend the winter out in the North Atlantic, close to that North Atlantic gyre, and then they migrate. And they migrate north and they carry those plastics with them. And so there is some discussion that the birds can actually carry a lot, some plastics, it's probably not a big amount, but they can carry some plastics. And so that's a little bit why we, you know, we did our poop study. Um, you know, and it does kind of speak to the fact that the birds are full of plastics and they're actually redistributing the plastics around the environment. And And we did a study uh, with colleagues in the Faroe Islands where we looked at the, um, at nests where the birds, they kind of, it's like owls, seabirds can kind of eat stuff and then all the hard stuff, they kind of puke back up again into a pellet or a bolus. And we found plastics, marine plastics in the bolus. So there's also this idea where birds could be actually eating plastics in the ocean and then redistributing it back onto the land. Yeah. Um, and so you both have these like physical environmental ways to move plastics. But then the thing that I think we're only beginning to grapple with is how animals actually might also be moving it around. That is super neat. That's not something that's ever been covered in any of our broadcasts in the past. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, but to the point of, of a lot of plastic getting into the ocean, and that is through rivers. Um, so one of the mm -hmm. things that I love to highlight, uh, there's a great organization that, or a group in Canada, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. And so a lot of people wonder, oh, okay, well, that's just the coast. You can do that in the east, you can do that in the west. Well, if you're in the middle of Saskatchewan, if you're in the middle of Iowa, you know, the rivers that are there lead to lakes, which lead to the ocean. So it ultimately is all connected. We found plastic on the bottom of the deepest trench in the world, in the most remote Pacific islands up in the Northern Arctic, where people haven't put it there, but because of that circulation, you end up with it in the most unlikely places. So it's really worth noting that, uh, you know, not littering is, is a good strategy all the time everywhere, uh, but the sort of things that you can do at home or as a government to help curb plastic pollution are applicable no matter where you happen to find yourself in the world. So I'm really glad we got a chance to cover that message. Speaking of governments, and before we go to the, the bevy of classes that are now covering a similar theme, and I, I love that you guys are all sharing this question, are there things that governments are doing? So your work, you mentioned super collaborative, you're working with Arctic partners around the globe, you have these great meetings, um, you're coming up with recommendations. Uh, are governments taking action on plastic pollution in a serious way? 
Yeah, I mean, the easy answer is is yes and no. I, I think that, um, I think, so the things I want to stress, so certainly the Canadian government, who I work for, uh, is is committed. And, you know, they're, um, you know, they're perhaps long policy documents that not everyone enjoys reading. But, you know, there there was the, they've developed a draft science assessment, they've done a Canadian plastic science agenda. We just did a whole bunch of funding for projects to do this. So I would say that one of the things that the Canadian government has done is identify research gaps and then actual funding to address those. Um, but I think more importantly, the kind of at like a bigger, higher scale or level is that one of the things that's really exciting to see Canada lead was the Oceans Charter. Uh, that was uh, really, you know, a, a commitment to trying to get people to to think about it. Um, yeah. And it was led by by Canada and, and others have joined, including including c- countries and organizations and industry. I think the UN is a really interesting forum and the UN Environment Program has been committed to plastic pollution and understanding what that means, how to limit it. And and certainly at the Arctic Council, so we're just coming off the Icelandic chairmanship of the Arctic Council, they have plastic priorities listed and we're moving into a Russian chairmanship for two years and they've identified plastic pollution, you know, is one of the things that they're considering uh, having it as a priority, you know, and that hasn't been finalized yet because they haven't taken over yet, um, you know, in their in their cycle of of the chairmanship. And so it's it's something that is is on the mind of many people. But I also want to really talk about for a second that it, it it can be really complex. And so plastic pollution is not equally affecting different parts of the globe. And the solutions that we have even even in Southern Canada don't apply to maybe Northern Canada or in other parts of the world. And so we often want an easy answer to say, okay, let's get rid of plastic bottles. You know, plastic bottles suck, let's get rid of them. That is a great solution for many of us who are in a position where we have running water, we have clean drinking water, but there are many regions in Canada uh, that don't have clean drinking water and need bottled water for, from a health and safety perspective. And so, uh, it, and that is true of, of re- disaster relief efforts, you know, after after hurricanes, and certainly in parts of the world where uh, clean drinking water is a challenge. So while um, it's easy to address plastic pollution as, as a problem, kind of identify it, we need, um, I often refer to it as a toolbox of solutions that all partners can really start to work on and, and, and understand. But it really does take, again, hard work sitting down and talking about it. Uh, couldn't be a better answer if we tried. I, I love this thing about plastic pollution that it's, it's become a real international effort and so many groups are working together on it. It is the most apolitical of issues. No one <laughs> no one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes, great. No one sees a bird that is cut open and you have tons of plastic inside it and goes, that's a fantastic thing, right? So it's something that we can all recognize as a species is a serious problem. And it's a really huge area of research, which is why it's so exciting to get to hear from you about all that's going on. Because really, this is an issue that's been in the public eye for the last 10, if that, years. Certainly in the last five, uh, Blue Planet 2 is a documentary being released. Uh, Canada's chairmanship of the G7 and, and plastic pollution was listed as a major issue there. So it's getting that sort of public resonance and political uh, action is being taken. Certainly uh, from the other partners we work with in Canada, it's really exciting to see that this is being taken uh, very, very seriously and there's a lot of work being done to mitigate it. So thank you for sharing uh, all your personal experience of that. So of course, Following the government question, the question we're getting from all the classrooms, which I love, I'm going to share it uh, from Ms. Fletcher's class right on the screen. They're exploring human impacts on the environment. What are one or two key things they can do to help fight the issue of plastics entering our oceans? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that I, I talk about the most is we've got to turn the tap off. No. So if you've got a, a flood in your basement, the first thing you do is you you run to turn the tap off. You don't run to the bucket. You, you get to the bucket to bail out your basement, but you don't do that first. And so the biggest thing that we can all do is, is, is reduce our use of plastic. And again, I think it, it can be complex. Plastic is very useful. Modern medical miracles happen every day because of plastics. And so I often think about what's our essential plastic um, and let's close the loop on that. So anything that's essential, again, medical supplies, um, we need to figure out how to keep them in the system so we don't lose that plastic to the environment. 
And then there's a whole bunch of non-essential plastics. Right. And so one of the things that I often do when I go to the grocery store, or I have a five-year-old, she's in grade one, and I pack her lunch, is what are the things that I can put into reusable containers that that is not going to get lost or, or used in a single time? And we often go to the store and, and we talk about in the store, you know, what are the things that can we buy just say almonds. Can we can we buy almonds in a package that is a hundred percent recyclable, or can we, you know, or is there a choice between a package that's not recyclable? So we always we often look at in an aisle we, and we look at all the different packaging. Let's just say for almonds, and we always try to choose the package that is a hundred percent recyclable, and that can be tricky depending on your area. So yeah. I would say that the 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 one thing that you can do is figure out what your non-essential plastic is that you can get rid of. And then the second thing you can frankly do is become an expert at what you can recycle in your area. Cause that's half the battle. And yeah. if you can figure out your recycling system, then you can go into the store and say, ah, I can recycle that, but not that. So let's get the one that has that recyclable plastic on it. And that is a huge, you know, a huge thing that can be, everyone can do in their community. I love the almond story. So for me personally, because of, of talks like this over the last few years, uh, September, we spend the entire month talking about marine plastics because it's of such interest to classrooms. So for me personally, I used to get milk in plastic bags, our, our Canadian tradition. <laughs> and now I get them in a carton. It costs a little bit more, but it is recyclable as opposed to the plastic bags, which aren't. Instead of getting coffee out all the time, which was lovely, and I, I like getting coffee out, I now brew coffee at home. And that saves a lot of waste and a lot of money. And so those sort of things can often, uh, you know, work together really nicely. Certainly litterless lunches is a great thing that a lot of our kids tuning in can do at home. Um, don't waste as a general principle is something that we can apply to all aspects of our lives, whether that's plastic, emissions, food waste, all those things help protect species, they help protect ecosystems and more. So I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, amazingly, time flies and we're having fun. We are nearing the very end of our broadcast. So what I want to do for kids at home is highlight again, um, if you want to learn more about Jennifer, jenniferbronte.com and at Jenny underscore pro. So you can check her out on social media and her website there. And of course, uh, we want to give a huge thanks again to the Arctic Institute of North America, making this whole series possible, highlighting all these incredible stories from across the Arctic. You can check them out at arctic.ucalgary.ca. We hope you'll join us for more programs soon. Jennifer, before we wrap up today, I know we've covered a lot of great things that kids can do at home. Is there one last message you want to leave us with, with regards to plastic pollution in the Arctic today? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone hears and knows is that often I hear kids talk about like, well, we've talked about all these things, all these things that we know. And I think the biggest communication is there's still so much we don't know. And so for those of you who are interested in participating in beach cleanups and, and entering that science and, and going into science, there's so much we don't know. The more, you know, it sounds cheesy, but the more we know, the more we know about what we don't know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I really encourage you that if this is something that's interesting, you know, follow the science loves and there, there's a lot of work to be done and we need all the different kinds of people and different thinking that we can to tackle these really big problems. Nice. Well, I can't think of a better message to leave with than that. So what I'll do is say a huge uh, thank you to you and uh, goodbye to all our groups tuning in on Aina's YouTube uh, and on Exploring by the Seed Your Pants. Jennifer, thank you so, so much for joining us today and we hope to have you back soon.